Hello everyone, welcome to our session on data governance. As some of you may remember, back in November in London, we had announced our partnership. And today, I'm delighted to be with Jim again to talk about our progress to date. Let's take a look at recent Goldman Sachs support. Security breaches, data loss, legal and compliance issues are slowing down many in their move to public clouds. Fundamentally, they're worried about loss of control. When you look at BigQuery, it was designed as a cloud native data warehouse. It was designed to address the needs of data-driven organization in a cloud-first world with its reliability, security, and its governance. So what is data governance and why it matters? Data governance is a strategic part of an organization that sets in place policies and procedures to maximize utilization and value of data for decisions and operations, while ensuring data quality standards, privacy standards, security controls, and regulatory compliance. GCP provides robust tools and technology to protect and govern your throughout the life cycle of the data. We offer built-in protection at scale by default. Data is automatically encrypted while in transit and at rest. We supply tools and technology to efficiently govern all your data. For example, Cloud DLP helps you discover and classify sensitive data assets. Cloud IAM provides access control and visibility security policies, and our newly GA Cloud Data Catalog helps you discover and manage all your data. We support compliance requirements with all third-party certifications. Finally, we believe that the trust is created through transparency. And for that, we provide tools like Access Transparency, which gives you the visibility and accesses by either the support teams or the engineering teams at all times. Let's talk about some of the enhancements that we've done around data classes and fine-grained ACLs. Now with BigQuery's column ACL control, you can start thinking about data as a set of data classes, some more sensitive than others. Data catalog will control policies per data class. Audit logs will refer to these data classes. Let's take a look at it at a deeper level at the use case. Use data catalog to define a taxonomy of policy tags and add access permissions for users, groups, apply these policy tags to BigQuery columns. In this example, you may have first responders. They may need to have access to some of the PII information like location and phone and so forth. On the other hand, auditors would have additional access to maybe financial information. Now you'll be able to provide all these controls very easily. On GCP, we provide a platform that's end-to-end -end governed. You can imagine almost like a two zones, a free zone where not much of the sensitive data is really uh, present, but a governed zone where a lot of your governed data needs are placed. Past couple of years, we have been focusing on building the best in class capabilities for you to achieve better governance zone through BigQuery for all your enterprise needs. By establishing fine grained ACLs at column, table, row levels, and whatever. By integrating DLP to drive auto data classification. By introducing data catalog to describe, discover, and tag your data. However, data governance is a vast space, and many of you have complex hybrid environments. As we announced last November in London, we have partnered with Colibra, the market leading governance solutions provider to help you with all your data governance needs in this hybrid world. And I'm delighted to inform everyone that Colibra is now GA on GCP. And we're working together on joint roadmaps to further enhance our offerings to everyone. As we saw before, Data Catalog and BigQuery allows you to govern data at a finer granularity through policy tags. But governance is much more than that. 
We also need to apply revoke, modify, access in response to events across your enterprise. As I mentioned earlier, we've already begun integrating Calibra into GCP services. Our catalogs are designed to work together to help system integrate, achieve data governance for hybrid systems, whether it's your multi-client needs or cloud and on-prem needs. With Calibra on GCP, you will have the best of the two worlds to achieve all your data analytics and data governance needs. My partner, Jim, will now walk you through Calibra on GCP journey. That's great. Thank you, Aaron. I really appreciate the, uh, the uh, introduction and excited to share with you guys uh, a use case. Now, there's basically countless ways that you can uh, identify value from this combined offering, but we're going to settle in on a use case defined by George, who's a business analyst working on the Google Analytics platform. And he has a goal. His goal is customer satisfaction. Um, now, that's a year-long endeavor, but over, over the year, he's looking for different data sets that uh, answer different questions that show how customer satisfaction is achieved, maintained, it grows, and it reduces churn. So in this situation, we're going to focus on a moment in time where George is looking for additional data uh, beyond what George is working with thus far to answer some questions about customer churn. Uh, the process is going to follow something like this, and it's going to be a use case around what we call data provisioning. And this is a situation where there's only a subset of data uh, that George currently has access to, but looking for what else might be available to use. So George will start with uh, an example of using Calibra uh, to actually work on the uh, Google Cloud to search the catalog. And once that's done, our job is to help uh, navigate George through the shopping experience, go out and fetch the data for George, and present it back to George for consumption. So let's go ahead and jump in. So let's suppose George starts. So the first thing that George is gonna do using this shopping metaphor is try to find a door to open. And so George being kind of a non-technical person uh, might start with more of a business term. So George is gonna type in customer churn. And customer churn for George is, is a definition uh, that's been defined in his business glossary and is shared within the entire company. Um, now, when George first sees this, uh, he can then navigate to different uh, facts and facets such as picking business terms. And these business terms then uh, provide various things within the glossary that George can choose from. And if George chooses customer churn, it takes George to the next step. Now, this is like opening up a door uh, to our graph of information uh, uh, available to George. And some of the things that George might see is which, customer, you know, which models are actually available underneath the definition of customer churn, such as customer or order or product, uh, some financial metrics, tags, and other things. And this is a means of George basically getting oriented within the store and finding out where to go to next. And let's suppose George says, you know, customer is a really important thing, but I'd like to know a little bit more about it. So one of the first things we do is, is show George what is the content of customer as a logical model. And here we're listing all of the different attributes and fields that really make up the definition of the canonical definition of a customer. In any one of these, uh, George can uh, click on one of the definitions and learn more about them, again, as an asset within the graph that, again, relates up to the customer domain model that, again, mapped to customer churn as a business term. Now, Cliff might say, okay, this is great. I like the content here, so let me learn more. So I'm going to navigate down the aisle. Uh, as, as Cliff navigates down the aisle of this kind of customer-defined aisle, uh, when you find various uh, things that are grouped, such as systems, and within systems uh, might have uh, databases, and within that might have schemas, and eventually you get down to tables. These are catalog assets that tell Cliff about the various things that are aware, that the, the company is aware of, that have been classified and mapped to the uh, logical model of customer. And so this kind of gives you an inventory of, of ultimately what is in this aisle that Cliff is shopping, known by customer. Uh, furthermore, Cliff might want to say, okay, let me tell me more. And this is where we show uh, the integration in the inheritance uh, to a table all the way back to uh, policies and rules and regulations and limitations and reference data that make up the body of governance that's within the Cleaver system. So in this situation, Cliff can see very quickly that I have a table within here called customer product sales that has actually been uh, classified through machine learning to the customer domain and by definition then inherits all the items that are uh, classifications and standards and policies that you see in green illustrated uh, to the left of the screen. Uh, once Cliff understands this, Cliff might say, okay, well, okay, I, I like this, but I want to know where these products have actually come from. What, where, are these, where do these tables come from and where do they go and maybe what happens? And that's what we call lineage. 
Uh, this is the idea of how did the data actually arrive at this point and destination? Where else does it go after this destination? Who uses it? And did anything happen to it on its destination to me, such as uh, some type of uh, transformation uh, object? So we can actually capture all the underlying transformation that may have happened to this physical asset uh, that you're considering for uh, shopping purposes. So this gives Cliff like a, where's this stuff made? Is it made in the US, is it made in Italy, somewhere else? Uh, I would like to know, as well as what happened on its journey uh, along the way. Um, now, the next thing Cliff might say is, okay, I'm now down to five different items to choose on the shelf. How do I uh, delineate between them? How do I know which one is right for me? Well, that oftentimes is being done through tribal knowledge or what did I do in the past, but it's generally not objective or defendable and doesn't always lead to trustworthy information. So what we offer in the Kluber uh, solution are highly visible and easy uh, visualization around a profile score. And the goal is to provide Cliff very quickly kind of front of label uh, uh, demarcations about what is the best for what they want. So in this situation, we're showing uh, various attributes that make up customer that were interest of, of interest to George and showing which system actually has the best. So for example, the customer billing seems to have the high score for email, whereas customer product sales has the best information for both address and for churn date. Since those are important, it seems like customer product sales is something that would be pretty important to, uh, to George. Now, maybe that's not enough front of label. Some of us shoppers like to turn the label around, and if necessary, we can get some detailed statistical information about that column using uh, stats around null values, anonymous values, uh, distribution frequencies, et cetera, that can really help Cliff uh, choose which of these uh, data sets uh, to use uh, for his analysis. Now, Cliff has said, okay, this is the one I want. I'm adding customer product sales, as you see illustrated in the center here. And this is in Cliff's shopping basket. Now, you can see there are other data sets that were already in there. Let's just assume that Cliff had already shopped for things, and maybe these were uh, sitting in wait. But the next big thing that Cliff wants to do is say, you know what, I'm not just buying product at the grocery store. I'm actually asking for data, and I need to ask for request. So Cliff starts the request process. And the, each, each customer can set up its own need for how they would manage this process. But ultimately, the oh, data owner itself that would grant you know, authorization to this data would want to know why do you want it? Uh, how long are you going to use it? Uh, where are you going to use it, uh, et cetera? And so Cliff fills out this level of information. I'm sorry, George enters this level of information in the data set request. And one thing I'll draw your attention to is that uh, George has actually selected lease. A uh, lease is this notion of a short-term duration, but I want a physical copy of the data, whereas borrow would be an example of something I just want to have virtualized for a very, very short period of time, and buy would be I actually want to take a full copy uh, going forward. And then ultimately, you might also say, where do I want to take it? And here, we're, we're actually going to bring the data set to Google BigQuery. And of course, there are dates uh, for how long uh, George would like to use it. Now, and after George has actually submitted this request, it, it needs to go over to the data owner. So we're going to switch perspectives really quickly and look at Joanna, and she receives an inbound request uh, from George. And so uh, you can see that Joanna has seen the same information uh, that George entered in in the request in kind of the center panel. And off to the right is where uh, Joanna would then determine whether she uh, wants to grant approval for this or not. Now, I'm showing you a manual version for this now, obviously, for effect but you can set up rules and workflows that can automate this process based on who's making the request, for what purpose, for how long, and where is it gonna go. Um, but this is a, a, you can either manually do it or you can set up automated rules. But since she actually approves this request, then it's gonna go back to George. And when it comes back to George, there's one last thing that he has to do. He has to acknowledge all of the items to the right uh, that are uh, part and parcel with actually taking a lease of data for a period of time to Google BigQuery. And you'll remember those were established in those green boxes earlier on when we looked at the customer domain. And they were all inherited through to the uh, data set that Cliff or George is now asking for. So once uh, George is actually approved of this request, uh, uh, he can now uh, check out. And so this is the really interesting part. So because again, George is not a technician, we don't want uh, George to have to do a bunch of assembly, et cetera. We're now going to kick off a data provisioning process. And so we really are uh, finished up with step one here. And then the next step is that we're actually going to have an edge-based appliance. It really is close to the data center, wherever it happens to be. Suppose it's on your own, own premise. It could be in another cloud. Uh, it could be a SaaS-based solution that you're working with. 
there would be this virtual uh, appliance that actually is reading back to the uh, Google Cloud server to talk to the Clever Cloud and say, do I have any instructions? And the instructions would be this request that uh, uh, George has asked for and received approval. They would be downloaded and they would execute a distributed query against the underlying data set or data sets uh, that have been approved. After that data is extracted, it would then be composited, which is basically the process of uh, looking for any duplication within that data set and compositing it down to a golden record, uh, choosing the best attributes uh, from amongst the contributors. Once that's been done, then we also want to acknowledge that not all Georges are alike. Some Georges might have access to uh, certain data elements that uh, others are not. And that's where we deploy this uh, policy enforcement around access management. We would actually eliminate data that's not actually available for George to, to look at, either by redacting it or masking it before it's passed along to be loaded into BigQuery for the request. Once that's done, the data is then encrypted, uh, transformed up to uh, the appropriate landing spot for BigQuery, and then subsequently loaded into BigQuery. And once that's been done, now uh, George is notified that the data set is ready for processing. Now, when the data is ready for processing, George can do a couple of things. You can look at the data kind of in the raw, um, directly within BigQuery, but more likely, uh, George is going to want to look at this in kind of a BI reporting or analytic environment of choice, and let's suppose it's Looker. And so that's exactly how um, George is going to start working with this new data set and maybe either alone or in combination with other data sets that were already uh, uh, available to George uh, within uh, BigQuery uh, as well as uh, Google Catalog, uh, but or, or uh, in combination or separately. So uh, now George has actually been able to almost really at the click of a button have data provision uh, for his use uh, without having to write any code. And it's all been done under a governed use case. And so that's really what we call uh, data use provision. But to really round out the use case, we have to uh, send notification and a reminder to George that you know, you're just using this data for a short period of time. In order to comply with the data use agreement, you actually have to get rid of it when you're done with it. So we send a notice off to, uh, to George to let him know exactly that your, uh, your uh, use of the data is expired and it's time to get rid of it. And of course, then we'll notify Joanna if the same has occurred. Uh, if in fact it's been compliant and George did get rid of it, otherwise it would get escalated and she would be able to follow up accordingly to make sure that we stay in compliance. Now, this is a, a, just one of many, many use cases to follow. We thought it was a, a good illustration of how the combined solution works together in, in a highly relevant use case. Um, in terms of where we are today, uh, everyone was kind enough to announce uh, that we're available um, on Google Cloud um, as of July 6th. Now, we are also um, working on, on more and more tighter integration. And you'll see where we are now, really, storage with uh, the principle of uh, least privilege with data class level security is available within Google. And, and through the integration with um, Calibra, we also offer this ability to shop and discover and, and make that request for data. And it could be data that's already in BigQuery or in cloud storage that they're just asking for approval, or it might actually need to be provisioned. In situations where it actually needs to be provisioned, uh, we'll be uh, covering that within uh, the next year's roadmap. But I think I'd also like to share with you that later this year, maybe by the end of the year, uh, Calibra Data Intelligence for your convenience will be available on the uh, Google Cloud Marketplace. And if you've uh, enjoyed what you've uh, listened to here, I really highly recommend that you follow uh, your other peers in the industry. And it's, even though we just announced this, uh, a short, short period of time ago, we have a large number of customers who've already expressed interest and are starting that journey with us. Um, so if you would like to follow in, in their footsteps, uh, please, I, I would suggest you follow up either at uh, the Google uh, Cloud website or the Clever website. Uh, on behalf of Evan and myself, uh, we'd like to thank you for, for joining us, uh, as well as wish you guys uh, safety in these difficult times. Thank you.